this is an analysis that we conducted over the past uh, few months that tried to get into this notion of the initial drop in GFR uh, that is classically seen with any SGLT2 inhibitor. Um, initially, actually, that was felt to be a negative because um, obviously GFR is important and you don't want to lose GFR, but we quickly realized that in Embereg outcome, the initial dip in GFR was actually associated with a long-term stabilization of GFR, such that at the end of the day uh, or at the end of the trial, um, the patients that were randomized to empagliflozin, even though they had experienced an initial drop in their GFR, actually had a better GFR at three years than did uh, patients who were randomized to placebo. So it's very reminiscent of the uh, RAS blockade story with ACE inhibitors or ARBs, where there's an initial hit, if you will, if you can use that terminology, initial uh, penalty in terms of declining GFR, then stabilization, so that if you follow the patients out long enough, um, that initial drop in GFR did not portend any adverse renal outcomes. In fact, the opposite, that it's almost as if you needed to have that drop in GFR to incur the benefit long-term, which is stabilization of GFR. Now, the, the mechanistic underpinnings of that is not quite clear. I think in the RAS inhibitor story, um, most of the nephrology experts agree that it's this um, reduction in glomerular filtration, which is a direct reflection of reduction in intraglomerular pressure. And that potentially can lead to less barotrauma to the glomerulus and preserve the glomerular function. So it's almost like you're offloading the glomerulus by decreasing the pressure. But when you decrease the pressure, and this is related to renal hemodynamics, when you decrease the pressure, the net net is a reduction in GFR, but that reduction in pressure is actually important for pr preservation of renal function. So that th those dynamics are very reminiscent in, when you look at SGLT2 inhibitors. Now, I'm not sure we understand the mechanisms by which that initial drop in GFR occurs and, and then stabilization. There, there are many theories. The initial theory, which was very attractive, was that it's very similar to the RAS blockade story, that there's a decrease in glomerular pressure leading to stabilization. Um, it's a little bit different uh, in terms of where the, um, the, the changes in renal hemodynamics occur with the SGLT2 inhibitors. With the RAS blockers, um, it was felt to be a um, reduction in the um, um, I want, to, I, always, I want to make sure I say this right because the, uh, the uh, terminology can be a little uh, confusing. It's the efferent arteriole that essentially exits the glomerulus. I'm talking about RAS blockade. It's the efferent arteriole that uh, basically drains the glomerulus, if you will. Uh, the caliber of those vessels increases, so the tone of the vessels decreases when you're using a RAS blockade. And when you do that, if you, if you think of the glomerulus as a closed system, if you're uh, decreasing the tone of the exiting arteriole, the pressure within the glomerulus drops. So I think that's, that's pretty much agreed upon. It's been um, a, a concept that has been present for decades in, in terms of how RAS blockade, blockade works. With the SGLT2 inhibitors, the story had been, again, based on very little data, but the story had been that the uh, afferent arterial, the, the arterial that goes into the glomerulus, brings blood into the glomerulus, uh, that became vasoconstricted. So the tone of that arterial actually decreased, uh, uh, I'm sorry, actually increased. Um, so instead of opening up the efferent arterial, you, you basically shut down the afferent arterial, but the net-net effect would be a reduction in glomerular pressure, right? If you're increasing the drainage or decreasing the flow, 
um, you're decreasing the pressure in the glomerulus. That was a very attractive theory uh, because it made perfect sense. And, and, and also, the, uh, I, sh I should add that in most of the SGLT2 inhibitor trials, when they uh, uh, measure GFR after stopping study drug, you, s you get this reversion back to normal, suggesting that even that initial hit that you took with GFR wasn't a permanent uh, penalty. It was really just hemodynamics. So that all sounds really well and good, but my understanding is that lately there's been some data suggesting that that initial theory may not be true, that, that at least in type 2 diabetes, investigators have actually not been able to confirm that this decrease in afferent arterial, blood, arterial or blood flow to the glomerulus is actually a real concept. So suffice to say that there's lots of controversy in this, in this specific area that I will leave for the nephrologist to, to argue about. As, a, as an endocrinologist, I, I think uh, the, the, the main effect that we recognize from these drugs is that they do preserve uh, or, or do delay the progression of CKD. So I'll, I'll, we'll leave it up to the kidney specialist to figure out exactly, exactly why. In this analysis, um, we, we basically looked at those patients that dropped more than we would have expected. So the usual drop in GFR is less than 10%. So we looked at patients that dropped more than 10%. And uh, we, we, we approached this in two ways. The first is um, to look at risk factors for uh, patients who would drop more than 10%. And, and some of those would be uh, understood like lower GFR, the, the presence of diuretic therapy at baseline, things that you might uh, consider would accentuate the, the hemodynamic effects of these, of these medications. So we looked at those risk factors uh, and how they would uh, affect patients' um, response in terms of uh, cardiovascular outcomes and renal outcomes. And what we determined is that those patients that were at the greatest risk for dropping GFR more than 10% still had a benefit in terms of the cardiac and the renal uh, uh, advantages of being on the SGLT2 inhibitor. And then we conducted, as, as part of this study, a mediation analysis to determine if the drop in GFR um, either mediated or was counter uh, to the benefits on renal outcomes, and, and the effect was, was very, very modest. So we did not feel that this was necessarily a predictor of who would do well or was a red flag in patients who wouldn't do well. So, so th that's the, in a nutshell, this, uh, th th this um, uh, analysis. This is a post hoc analysis. It wasn't um, pre-specified, so it has all the caveats of, of analyses which are done um, after studies are completed to try to determine a little bit more about the physiological impact of the medication in, in certain subgroups.